Hey, it's Liberty and today I'm going to be recommending some books that are completely anti-romantic, no romance at all. If you're anything like me and you can't stand the fact that as soon as February rolls around, you go onto booktube and you just see like tons and tons of romance recommendations, then this video is going to be perfect for you. Don't read Christmas books at Christmas time and Valentine's Day isn't really a thing anyway, it's just sort of an invented day so people will go and spend money in between Christmas and like Easter or summer. Um, so I'm not down to get screwed by capitalism any more than I already am. So if you like this, do give it a thumbs up and I make videos all about books, personality, history, culture and more. So do check those out and subscribe if you would like to. But for now, I'm going to get straight into my recommendations. Sorry, I'm an anti the first book I'm going to recommend is The Life of Pi. The protagonist of this novel is Pi and he's 16 years old. Um, he's Tamil, he grew up in Pondicherry with his family who run a zoo. The start of this book reads like a memoir and you get to understand a lot about animals and zoology and all of that. However, this novel quickly turns into an adventure when the family who are moving to Canada along with all of their animals, the boat they're on gets into, you know, choppy waters and Pi finds himself in a lifeboat with a tiger, a hyena and a zebra and an orangutan just by himself floating in the ocean. Pi has to survive with all these animals, survive despite all these animals uh, and this won the Man Booker Prize in 2001 so I mean it's it's lauded by critics and readers alike. The beauty of this novel is it can be interpreted in many different ways and you can take away sort of as much and as little as you want. You can read it as a straight adventure story, you can sort of look at it through the frame of sort of animals relationship with humans, um, survival and what it means to be human and you can take that away if you would like. There's a segment where there's a sort of big discussion about spirituality. Big theme of this novel is faith. Faith in gods, faith in yourself, faith in humanity, in the world. Again, many different levels to that discussion. Pi's trying to figure out his place in the world. Um, and there's actually, you know, for an adventure story about animals and surviving a shipwreck, there's a fair bit of humour in this too. The writing style is beautiful. It very much flows in a way that almost feels like intentionally aquatic. You really feel for Pi as he sort of wakes up in this and has to adjust to this new reality. Um, and he contemplates death a lot, you know, either by water or by tiger whose name is Richard Parker <laughs> their relationship is really sort of at the heart of this novel you know boy and tiger um, and their quest for survival and there's a lot of resilience in the face of adversity I mean it's gorgeous it's massively worth the hype in my opinion yeah you can go onto any online discussion forum and see people argue about what it means for ages and that's what I love about literature sorry I'm an anti -romance. The next book I have to recommend is Before the Fall, and this is a thriller set in the sky. Um, 11 people are on a private jet flying from Martha's Vineyard to New York, I think, and 10 of them are these really sort of privileged, rich people. And the 11th is a painter who's uh, having a bit of a dip in his career. But 16 minutes into the flight, something goes terribly, terribly wrong. And the plane plunges into the ocean. This novel is told in two strands. One is in the present and follows the sort of the plane crash in the aftermath and then the other is sort of going back into the past into all the different passengers lives and how they intertwine and converge and what really caused the crash comes into view. These are all very sort of influential people that end up on this plane that happens to crash and our painter whose name is Scott Burrows he develops this relationship with this little boy he's four years old he has to look after him and their relationship is sort of really at the center of the sort of present strand of the story. This novel contains so much adrenaline. I was so anxious in the way that the best thrillers make you anxious. Um, you experience the sort of aftermath of the accident. Scott sort of gains notoriety and the media are sort of circulating around him while the police are trying to figure out what on earth happened. Honestly, I would say that's all I'm going to say. Pick this book up. It's better knowing less then I mean even I would go so far as to say don't even read the blurb because the blurb gives quite a lot away about the plot and I'm just trying to be deliberately vague um, but it's so engrossing it's all about 
people, um, human nature, as all the best stories are. And yeah, that's it. I read this while working at Waterstones. I think it was a book of the month or something, but really good. Sorry, I'm an anti -romantic. My next recommendation is Sophie's World. And this is a very interesting one because this is um, all about philosophy. And Sophie is a 14 year old girl. She's living in Norway. She lives with her mother. Her father sort of is overseas working a lot of the time. So he's quite absent. One day she comes home from school and discovers in her letterbox, these two notes, one of which says, who are you? And the other one says, where does the world come from? This book is sort of many things in one. It is a sort of history of predominantly Western philosophy. It's this story of a young girl, trying to, you know, grappling with trying to find her place in the world. And it's us, the reader, trying to untangle all of these strands of which the plot is made up of. Sophie ends up sort of taking a philosophy correspondence course, essentially, with a mysterious person who is only known as Alberto Knox, who sort of delivers stuff into her letterbox. Sophie begins to question her way of looking at the world. It very much spins the cogs in her brain and makes her think about the world differently. She sort of dangerously becomes more and more objective and again, there's another strand of the plot, which I don't really want to go too much into, but it involves a certain mystery that Sophie has to figure out involving mysterious people. But I really enjoyed this book. I really want to read it again as an adult because I tried to read this several times way too young. I think I was like nine or something ridiculous like that. Um, and then I finally finished it a few years later, but I remember barely anything about it. I remember a lot at the beginning because I had to read that several times in order to get into it. But um, yeah, it's a great way to learn about philosophy and g nice plot, mysterious. Sorry, I'm an anti -romantic. So my next recommendation is The Book Thief. I'm going to start off by saying this is an incredibly emotional book. It's set in 1939 in Nazi Germany and the main character is Liesl and one day she's at her brother's graveside when she sort of sees half buried in the snow a book called The Gravedigger's Handbook and she steals it and this sort of begins to be a habit for her. She's living with foster parents and her foster father sort of teaches her how to read and you know she falls in love with books and words and stories. This leads Liesl to sort of stealing more books um, from Nazi book burnings, from the mayor's library. She goes a bit rogue. <laughs> Obviously it's Nazi Germany and Liesl's family are far from Nazi sympathisers so they sort of end up, I will say reluctantly, um, because her foster father has you know taken this route of I want to make myself invisible so I don't draw attention to myself but they do end up hiding a Jewish man in their basement and so the plot sort of spins on in that direction and that's all I'm giving you for now because I don't want to give too many spoilers. This book stands out I would say from a lot of Nazi Germany era stuff that I have personally read. Um, it's narrated by death that's not a spoiler, it literally says it. It's like the first page is narrated by death. He knows about these events because he is also a book thief. He stole Liesl's diary from this period. We know through the Jewish man that they hide, the family hides. We know his fears and what he's been through. It's more of a sort of micro focus on this area and the different sort of levels of society and how they are all affected by the Nazi regime. And remember, we are 1939 and it sort of spans most of the Second World War. I think it goes up to 43-ish. Um, but yeah, so it sort of very much focuses on the everyday lives. Think Jojo Rabbit in terms of like, you'll have on one street, you'll have people living there who are Mem willing members of the Nazi party, you'll have unwilling members of the Nazi party, you'll have people who just want to lay low and then and just not do anything and then you'll have families hiding Jewish people in their basements or lofts and stuff. All relationships in this book is just, oh, they're just so fantastically written. The little family that sort of develops around Liesl and all of their relationships with each other is just like, it's just beautiful. Um, when I say that this is one of the most beautiful books that I've ever read, the style in which it's written, so poetic at times, lyrical, the descriptions are stunning and it will make you think and it will emotionally break you. Um, I remember exactly when and where I bought this book. Um, I can see the memory in my mind. Thinking about the film while deciding what books that I wanted to include in this video made me tear up just thinking about it. So I... Yeah, no, John Williams is an incredible composer and that definitely contributes to it. 
This is one of the best books ever written and you will not regret reading it, ever. Sorry, I'm an anti -romantic. Next up is a YA book and it is A Lady's Guide to Petticoats and Piracy. And this is the second book in the Montague Siblings trilogy, I think. Don't think there'll be any more. There are only three siblings. But you don't really have to have read the first one. You can read it as a standalone. The main character is Felicity Montague and we are in the mid 1800s, I think. Sorry, I meant to say that we are in the 18th century. We are in the mid 1700s. Felicity wants to be a doctor and we start this book in Edinburgh where she has gone because she is, you know, trying to get into the university there to study medicine. It's been a year after the events of the first book where, you know, she and her brother Monty and Percy, they all ended up sort of travelling around Europe on a little adventure. Quite a traumatic adventure, I must say. Her intelligence and determination aren't enough to get her into this medical school and basically the men who run Edinburgh University sort of refusing to let her in. When she hears, however, that a scientist who is very much an idol of hers is marrying an old school friend of hers. She is like, I'm going to travel to the wedding and I'm going to make him be my teacher. I'm going to show him how good I am and he's going to want to teach me. So she has no money to get there, um, unfortunately, but she fortuitously ends up meeting this mysterious stranger who sort of very much agrees to pay for them both to go over there um, if she'll pretend to be her sort of employer. So she does that, she gets over there. However, as most things in Felicity's life do, it turns into an adventure, which sort of takes her across Europe once again. I love the Montagues, especially Felicity. Um, these adventures are so much fun. The stakes are high, it's dangerous, but the characters are great. Uh, this book in particular, female friendships are really at the center of this. And you know, the bond between Felicity and her friend, Joanna, that she goes to visit. This book actually has really great asexual and aromantic representation in it. I mean, perfect for no romance. The adventure itself is gripping, twists and turns in the plot are fantastic. I have degrees in archeology, span so I love it when not only are we in the past, but we are in museums and, you know, around collections of artifacts. So that, I was a happy bunny reading this. That's all I'm gonna say about this because I've talked about this book a few times on my channel. Um, so if you're not new here, yeah, it might be a bit too much, but I highly recommend this. It's great fun. Sorry, I'm an anti -romantic. And the last book I'm gonna talk about is The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. This is one of the most well-known novels of all time and it's a fantasy story originally written for children, but has now sort of transcended that and become a classic for all ages. You may know already, but this is about Bilbo Baggins. He's a, the titular hobbit and um, he very much lives in his home under the hill in the shire he lives a cozy life he eats his good food he smokes his pipe um, he has no interest in leading a life of adventure although our insight into his family tree indicates that there's some adventure seeking happening somewhere in the back of his skull one day the wizard gandalf shows up at his house um, inviting him on an adventure that will not only change his life but the lives of all who live in middle earth he doesn't know that though. In fact, nobody knows that. Bilbo joins 12 dwarves in their quest to sort of retake their home mountain, um, the ancestral home of their sort of families. Uh, from the dragon Smaug, who's sort of very much made his home amongst all of the dwarves' treasures, because dragons love treasure and he's just sort of buried in there, having a great time. Bilbo joins the gang as their burglar, despite his fears that he is not the right person for the job. Middle Earth is obviously a remarkable place. Bilbo's journey is a physical one, but also a mental one. And he very much comes into himself as a hobbit and discovers there's so much, you know, more bravery within himself than he ever thought possible. He's your everyman protagonist and gives you the ability to very much see yourself in Bilbo. This is a story about fellowship and adventure and riddles, which if you haven't read it already, this is, you know, your sign to, because the world building is amazing in Middle Earth. It's incredible. I wish there was more women in it. I don't think there is any, because I don't think Galadriel is in The Hobbit. But yeah. Thank you for watching. Um, these are my recommendations for books with little or no romance. If you enjoyed this, do give this video a thumbs up and I make bookish videos and all sorts of videos. So do check those out and subscribe if you want. Happy reading. <laughs>